<clears throat> All right, we are in First Peter, and tonight we're going to give some of the, uh, at least one of the big clues to crack this case. <laughs> are you ready for some big clues to crack the case of what this is really about? <laughs> Uh, so was that what did you say Dennis that you like sitting in a class that they never tell you what they're talking about <laughs> all right we're in 1st Peter chapter 1 and um, I want to look at um, I want to really start with um, <clears throat> verse 3 of, of the first chapter, 1 Peter 1, 3. Um, and I want to go all the way down for now to verse 10. And I want to tell you, as I always do, give you some nugget to work with. I want to tell you <clears throat> that the, one of the main parts of the big picture of what he's trying to explain <clears throat> has to do with salvation. Okay? Okay. But, and this will help a lot right here, it is the salvation of your soul. Okay? It's the salvation of your soul. All right, some of you are going, oh, I thought this was going to be a holy thing, and, you know, but this is a very large part of what Peter is trying to communicate from first chapter to the end. Okay, so we're going to start at verse 3, and in here you can see actually um, uh, the pattern, <clears throat> and, uh, and we're going a little beyond the pattern just to, to bring it forth a little more. So verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Um, uh, there is a, just within this verse, there is a blessing of the Father who gets glory. <clears throat> He's getting glory uh, because he has begotten us again, and you'll see We'll see that over in what is it, second, third chapter? Oh, first Peter one. It's still this chapter. Um, towards the end, and um, well, it's actually chapter two, verse two. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, um, <clears throat> and in several other locations, but it will begin to uh, bring this fact out that there is this glory. To the Father, um, which is uh, according to his abundant mercy, and he hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, or a living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, so if you just and only took that one verse literally, speaking meaning of the death and resurrection of Christ, then you would still have the pattern with working within that verse. It's just could be expanded upon as he goes, and I believe he does. Okay, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible. And how many of you have searched the word corruptible or incorruptible in the scriptures? Good. All three of you. <clears throat> Four, th three and a quarter. Uh, 
And uh, it's obviously a real important word, right? Because it's used so many times. And it's, that's sort of an unusual word to be using so much. So it's a really, really important word in what he's trying to communicate, OK? Uh, incorruptible and undefiled, <clears throat> and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. OK, so you're still getting part uh, of the idea of verse 3 and verse 4. You are getting this, <clears throat> this um, whatever this thing is, it's incorruptible. <clears throat> um, it is also undefiled, meaning that it is, <clears throat> it's really putting the area that we want to find out what this is about into a category <clears throat> that is way up there with the Lord, okay? way up there with the Lord. And, um, and if I haven't said this before, and once we really get into this, you will find this, this thing that Peter's talking about, you'll find it all the way through the Old Testament, New Testament, it's still there. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Okay. <clears throat> to be revealed in the last time. So there is a, a power. There's a power that keeps us. And um, understanding that power is rock solid to the understanding of this. Uh, kept by the power of God through faith and that faith means that there is something you are holding on to. Okay? Something you are holding on to. <clears throat> um, unto salvation. And there's the word that we want to sort of key in here, but, but there, it'll be used a few more times. Unto salvation. All right. Now. Within the context of 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, let's just say that in the past, what Jesus did on the cross has laid the foundation for this. Okay? And the pattern is there in verse 3 through 5. The pattern is there. You see the result. Um, you, you've got the hope, you've got the, um, the power, you've got what's incorruptible, but you've also got being kept, being kept, okay, um, through a certain faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed, okay, so... The salvation doesn't sound like it's the full thing without the rest of it, okay? And ready to be revealed sounds like it hadn't been revealed yet. But now, now let's take it onto a little more personal plane here. <clears throat> Verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now... For a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Anybody search out the word heaviness? Anybody know in other places what it means? Mallory? Um, I just looked it up mm -hmm. now, and it uh, means um, to be in distress or uh, to be thrown into sorrow or grief. Yeah. Or depression. <laughs> um, though... You know, we have this hope, and we have this power, and it can keep us through a certain kind of faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed, except um, maybe you're going through distress and trials and depression, And he's, the wording is incredible. 
wherein you greatly enjoy, rejoice. So I'm, I'm ready to rejoice, right? And then he says, though now. And you're going, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it sounded to me like you're telling us all this stuff to get our faith to a certain level so that we can stand. Well, though now, for a season, if need be, what? <laughs> though now for a season, if need be, okay, well, who determines if I need it? And what's a season? Is that like fall? <laughs> you, know, or, you know, one of the seasons of the year? Is that months? Is that days? Is that years? All, it can be all of the above. Um, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And how many of you know what manifold means? How many of you know what manifold, uh, manifold is on a car? <clears throat> it means you got several... Oh, you got an answer back there, Jim? <laughs> You got several pipes, not just one going out the back. You got manifold pipes, <laughs> and uh, uh, manifold temptations, if need be. If need be, if need be, for you to be into depression. Come on, people. Okay. Verse 7, ah, bring us back up after knocking us down. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, okay, perisheth it, perisheth, goes along with incorruptible. Okay, and you're going to find several words that are going to line up with incorruptible, uh, undefiled, uh, fadeth not away, you're going to find those, and when you do, they're going to be like a flag waving that this is what, what we've studied before gives meaning to the new place that you see it. Okay? That you have to stay with the definitions. <clears throat> All right. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. So do you see the process again? Right there. You know, there's a, uh, there's a hope that the trial of your faith is much more precious than gold. But it is a trial that you're going into, suffering, right? Or a death. And then... And it's tried with fire, that it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so now we get the feeling, or should get the feeling, that the, the utensils, the pattern that he's using is not a, a eschatological, eschatological uh, thought in time. It is, um, it is something that we have to go through now, if necessary, if it need be. Okay. And it would be important to understand why it need be. Amen? Yeah. I mean, we, if we don't, then we're blindsided. If we do, then we're with the Lord. Then we're with the Lord. Praise God. All right. Um, <clears throat> verse 8, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving. The end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Okay? So... Now, if you read that in light of the end time, then you're, you're already too far out. You have to stay now 
with his thought where he took it when he said, though now, he changed the tenor, he, or he made sure that you understood the tenor was changed. The tenor is now changed from something that happened a long time ago to that same pattern happening in your life. Do you all understand that? Okay. So, um, so you could say then it's a repeat of the pattern. Jesus being the original pattern, or Christ and him crucified being the original pattern. But not just Christ and him crucified, as we understand that. Okay, but according to what he's trying to communicate here. Um, whom having not seen, and then yet now uh, believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. All right, so, and then and the next verse, searching what, in what manner. <clears throat> there is a living reality... Um, I'm going to just say it. There is a living reality that the prophets could not experience. That we can. It's also a dying reality. <laughs> but it's, there is this reality. Okay. And they were searching for it because they went through stuff, but they never got the fullness of it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So. What I want to do is um, I want to take you to a place that uh, in the scriptures that I believe uh, Peter often journeyed to. I believe that he found fellowship there. This is class six, by the way. Okay, thank you. Is that good enough? Or do you need the rest of it? <laughs> and that'll, some people watching on whatever, they're not used to me, so they're going to go, this is horrible. So you, you really are the devil. You know, they, could, they would be hard pressed to call me Antichrist since that's all I talk about. <laughs> Maybe the devil, but not Antichrist. All right. Um, and that location is where? <clears throat> it is the Psalms. Peter reveled in the Psalms. And I will tell you this, <clears throat> that we will, um, what we will do is we'll go through patches until we get to the end of First Peter. We'll go through patches and we'll stop and we'll revert back to the Psalms and we'll go, okay, look at this. I mean, we'll, we'll look at what he says and I'll say, now let's look at it in the Psalms. And you know, we'll go there and we'll go, oh my God, yes. Yes, for sure, that's exactly where he got it from. Isn't that great? Yeah. And we'll be able to do that with a lot of stuff. Okay, so now I, maybe I should give you a warning also. The Psalms are pretty big, okay? So um, I would say don't use the method of just trying to read through and then attach everything. <laughs> that would take probably years, okay? Um, but I can give you a quick and easy key. Would you like that? It's the key I used. I looked up the definitions that he was using in Psalms and the different words that he uses. And I found out that he, he had to be. There's too much. There's absolutely too much. So you just find the words in First John that pique your interest. What did I say? First Peter, thank you. I'm 
sick and you know, amazed that I'm even talking. <laughs> Seriously. <coughs> and uh, thank you all for the correction. God knows I need it. <coughs> um, uh, so I don't remember what I was saying. All right. So let's go. Uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, that's what I was saying is that if you find a word or a thought or a phrase that piques your interest in First Peter, try it, try it, just try it. Go like, uh, I don't know, I've got it on my, my, uh, my iPad, but, you know, get a Strong's Concordance or an app and that'll bring up the words and then put in those words or that word and then go to the places that it brings up and compare the usage in Psalms with what he's talking about. Even if you don't fully understand the picture yet, I guarantee you'll go, this guy's been, this is where he gets his, a lot of his stuff. Okay? And it's, it's kind of fun anyway. After a while, when you see it, it works. It's fun. <laughs> you know, I mean, to me, it's fun. It's like, Oh my God, I, you know, and you feel like you're, you're with him 2,000 years ago and he's, you know, he's trying to get the Lord and, and he doesn't have his letter to go by. <laughs> and so he's, I can just see him flipping over to Psalms, you know, and I can see him looking and then going, that answers that, you know. I could see him going through that. And, it, and then I could feel like when I was di discovering it, I felt like I was really genuinely following the trail of, of Peter, the man, in his search to know the Lord in this particular way. It really, really blessed me. <clears throat> All right. So here's, here's where we're going in Psalms. We're going to, to find out the salvation of our souls. Okay. Or to... You can put it another way, save my soul. I guess I should pre-qualify this. <clears throat> Most people, when they talk about getting saved, they say that, uh, you know, God saved my soul. Or they say, let's go out and win souls, right? You hear that all the time. But, you know, you're, when you're born again, it's your spirit that's born again. It's your spirit that's changed, not your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and emotion. You can be born again and still be carnal as a stump or natural as a stump in the sense of you still have the same mind, you still have the same emotional responses, you still have the same, right, will bringing you around. Yeah. So if I understand that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Now, the process, there's a specific process that, um, that Peter's talking about. He is, it is not a general thing. And we can, see, we can, we can apply that generally, what you just said, that, that to bring your mind, your will, and emotions in line with your spirit, which comes in line with God, right? Good old, good old um, spirit, soul, and body teaching, right? Okay, so you got your spirit. You got the soul, and then you got the body, okay? But then you got the Lord, and if you want to take that further, you go, you, go, you know, the, the head of the man, the head of the, is the, you know, the head of the woman is the man, the head of the man is God, and you can just keep an order going here. But it's supposed to flow down and manifest in the body. The body is the object of manifestation. That's spirit, soul, and body 101. Okay, we, we, I'm sure we have that class somewhere. Yes. All right, that's Spirit, Soul, and Body 101. Peter is not talking about Spirit, Soul, and Body 101. He is talking about the, uh, the same principle, but he's applying it specifically to one area that he shares over and over and over again. Okay. All right. 
So let's start with uh, Psalm 6. Psalm 6, verse 2 through 4. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak, O Lord. Heal me, for my bones are vexed. You know, so are mine, but anyway. My soul is also sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. All right. So, um, I have reason to believe that much of David's writings in the Psalms are specific to what Peter's talking about. I have reason to believe. Now, I don't believe all of it, but I mean just massive amounts of it. <clears throat> and it certainly explains some things. It explains that maybe, maybe, maybe David wasn't a whiner. I mean, have you ever read the Psalms? Dude, buck up there, cupcake. We need to get moving for God. You know? Um, Come to find out, there's a process that, and a thing that he wants to be with the Lord in that is, um, that is important to him, not just getting delivered. All right. So, have mercy upon me, O Lord. So this is not a sinner, right? For I am weak, O Lord. Okay? Um, Verse 3, my soul is sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. All right. So, surely you can see that, especially the end of verse 4. When he says, save me for thy mercy's sake, he's not talking about, um, you know, going to heaven. I mean, just so you know, there's not a whole, whole lot in the Old Testament about going to heaven. Just so you know. Um, Jesus came along and talked about Abraham being there and stuff like that. And so I think we're, we're good. But there's not really, not, you know, not like that. <clears throat> not like we do in the New Testament. Not like Christians do. Oh, it's all, it's all about just me going to heaven. Which, which we use the same phrase, um, save me for thy mercy's sake. Well, a sinner could pray that and understand what he's praying but that's not what David's praying. David has has is is working towards something. So let's let's I'm going to I'm not obviously I didn't look up every scripture on this subject, but we're going to go down a bunch of them here. Psalm 62 and verse 5, starting with verse 5. <coughs> Psalm 62, verse 5. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. Okay? So, who's David talking to? His His soul. Yeah. He's talking to his soul. You ever talk to your soul? I have a better question, probably one you can answer with the affirmative. Does your soul ever talk to you? (laughs) You know, it is a joy to have Dennis in this class. He does more than y'all could ever know. (laughs) It's great. (laughs) Um, He only is my rock and my salvation. So there is a salvation of his soul that he's seeking, though he is one of the most godly men. And his heart, his heart is a heart after God. But sometimes he has soul problems. Sometimes he's a soul man. You know, 
Okay? <clears throat> so that's a big deal to him. Okay. And yet, right here, comes again. And yet, I don't believe most of the times when he's talking about this, he's talking about what we talk about when we talk about save my soul. We go, <clears throat> well, my neighbor, you know, my, my neighbor, we were supposed to you know, use the laundry line between the houses. I know people don't do that anymore. And they, she kept her laundry up there too long, and I'm upset, you know, and Lord, save my soul. Or, or something worse. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think there's something much deeper. Can I say it? Something more spiritual or hopefully more spiritual um, than just your general soul problems. Okay? Than just your general soul, which we, have we ever taught on this before? All the time. But not what Peter's talking about. Not in this way. All right. <clears throat> um, my salvation. He is my def defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. All right. So again, we've, we and everyone, every other Christian has read that in relationship to, you know, Lord, I'm going to flunk this test if you don't help me. Chris, you ever pray something like that? I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to do good on this test if you don't help me, Lord. <laughs> have any of us, I'll have all of us at some point, something like that. For sure, of course, you know. So we're praying that because God, you're my salvation, my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in you. Yeah, and my test scores. You know, and he's going, stop using it like that. <laughs> all right. Psalm 72, Psalm 72, verse 13 and 14. He shall spare, this is uh, Psalm 72, verse 13. He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. All right. Well, that can't be salvation to heaven. You know, I only save the needy people. You know, I mean, you can, you can be going along pretty good in life and still bow your knee and ask Jesus into your heart and be saved. You know, you don't have to get saved because you're in a present crisis. <laughs> and if everybody that was in a present crisis got saved, we wouldn't have to worry about the world, <laughs> right? <clears throat> All right. Um, verse 14, he shall redeem their soul from deceit. Oh, oh, now we're starting to get into some of the things that, that we need soul salvation. <laughs> from deceit and violence, and y'all remember the word violence, don't you, from some of you might from the Noah class, yeah. <clears throat> and, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. All right. So, sounds like a death happened there at the end, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> let's see. Let's do... Uh, Psalm 120, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> Psalm 120, verse 1 and 2. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. All right. So, just like with the other, uh, but this one for sure, um, He's, it's like, he's in the middle of a crisis. And we've all, we've all studied this, but I need to make sure it's clear what we're talking about, at least up to this point. He's in a crisis, and someone has done something to him, something 
evil or something they shouldn't have done, something hurtful or whatever, and his soul is reacting, okay? His soul is reacting. We've all experienced this. Don't look at me so holy. Your soul is reacting. And, and David is going, you know, he's, he's not saying, <clears throat> fix those people. He's saying, save me from my soul. Amen? Yes. Now, this is part of it, but this is, it, this, is, uh, this is part of the process, but this is not the thing. So there is a major thing in the Psalms where David gets into these problems and he doesn't do like the average Christian. He doesn't blame them or this or that. Or he sees his, his part and he says, save me from this. My soul is raging. My soul is you know, <clears throat> saying this is unfair or this is, you know, unjust or, or they, why did they do that to me? And, <clears throat> you know, that's a, that's a dark world. Did you know that? It can go, it can get dark, you know. <clears throat> and um, David is recognizing that, you know, I don't know, you know, if he could almost say something like this, I don't know about their heart. But I'm David, and I'm supposed to have a heart after God. And I'm letting my soul run wild, you know? And, and then, you know, stand up for its own rights and all this kind of stuff, all right? <clears throat> so soul salvation, the salvation of your soul is different than the salvation of your spirit. The salvation of your spirit or being born again is a one-time event. You don't have to get, keep getting saved. Y'all know that, right? Somebody tell that to Mike. Anyway, <clears throat> just kidding. Just kidding. It's an old joke that only a few of us know. <clears throat> but if you'd like to know about it, what happened was not really. <clears throat> um, but the salvation of your soul can happen over and over and over again. Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> I think within just the realm of what we've taught these, these areas, I think there is, a, there is a place for maturity. I think maturity can happen in your, in your soul where you recognize that Christ is your life and you know, it's a maturity in him, of him, in him, <clears throat> whereby you get in those situations and you don't have to react every time. Now, I'm just talking about our understanding, not First Peter's explanation. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and you, and Christ begins to grow. And we, we had some people address that during our early part of saying, what is this about? You know, and we said, well, it's about, you know, and I go, that's very good. That's what we teach. That ain't it. Y'all remember that? So, but it, it's applicable in this, these points that we're talking about right now. It is applicable in these points that there is soul problems in the midst of something else that is bigger that Peter wants to communicate. And that's why we're not just jumping right into the fullness yet. We're still, you know, there's enough with, with what I've been sharing right now for you to start scraping out and going, oh, I think this might be, you know, you know I'm looking at this. And <clears throat> but the Lord has told me, I mean, and I'm glad, and the Lord has told me to proceed this way because you need to discover this. And if you see it, Oh, baby, <laughs> you know, that's going to be wonderful. All right, so um, Psalm 123, verse 4. 
Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Wow. Wow, people. <laughs> How many of you are exceedingly filled with the scorning of those who are at ease? Um, and with the contempt of the proud. Sounds like you're full of pride. You know? Oh, judging thing, that judging thing. <clears throat> you have the ability to judge someone else. Like, I am judging how proud you're acting right now. And you're doing it proudly. You're judging them proudly. <clears throat> um, soul salvation. We need the salvation of our souls. <clears throat> uh, Psalm 124, verse 2. Psalm 124, verse 2, starting with verse 2. We'll do 2 through 5. If it had not been, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The streams had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Wow. Is this, is this, did we just move in the last two sets of scriptures into scary waters? <clears throat> I mean, they really are. I mean, it's like, oh my God, this is like a monster creeping over me and laying over the top of me and being the, the Lord, you know. And, um, and uh, what, what, I'm going to read that one again. Is that all right? If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, oh, baby, <laughs> when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Wow. Reacting, reacting. When, then. Do you see it? When, then. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us. The streams had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. <clears throat> All right, so um, uh, if the Lord hadn't been on their side, The proud waters would go over your soul, and and you know it's like a it's like being, it's like thrown into the depths of a dark, dank tank of of water, filth, and it's flooding you, and it's filling you, and it's flowing over you and out of you to others, and you know there's no explanation. <clears throat> on the last two of these that were pretty dire, there's no explanation if the persons who did this to, if it's David, <clears throat> that the persons who did this to David were r bad or wrong. You understand? Somebody can do something to you and they're not really even trying, but you go, well, why did they do that? And they go, hmm. you know, if you could talk to them later, they go, I, I didn't do that. That wasn't what I was doing. You know, I sneezed. <laughs> oh, I thought you were spitting on me. You know, I mean, I'm trying to give a dumb example, but could you see how that could happen? <clears throat> we, get, we get overwhelmed with this stuff. Um, okay, uh, Psalm 138.3. Uh, 
138. In the day when I cried, thou answeredest me and strengthened and strengthenedest me with strength in my soul. All right. So, didn't say, strengthen my hands to, to go to war. Right? And say, it didn't say, strengthen my will to fight the enemy. It's like, I'm the problem here. I mean, if, even if they're a problem, that's God's business. So we're just trying to understand the salvation of the soul before we can get into the other. But it's very interesting that Peter um, this whole book basically involves the necessity of the salvation of the soul. All right. Y'all want a few more or should we stop? Okay, um, then let's do, let's do uh, Psalm 13, verse 1 through 6. 13, yeah, Psalm 13, verse 1 through 6. All right, this is a nice conversation between David and the Lord. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? <laughs> I'm <he> Hello? <laughs> I'm here. I'm still here. You remember me, David? <clears throat> How long wilt thou hide thy face from me, which is a big deal. Now we're looking at something here. <clears throat> he's not just wanting his soul fixed, though he'll deal with that, but he needs to see the face of the Lord. Okay. Now, again, everything that we've said, there's nothing new in this <laughs> that you haven't heard me teach a million times. So why are we going over it again? We're going over it because we're not pollen you. You know? We're going by Peter, and we're getting what Peter has, and we're going to go, we're going to find out what was so deep in his heart that he made the whole book. And I mean, it, it's just mind-blowing how verses that we would have never guessed that this is what he's talking about. Once we, you know, once we keep putting pieces together like we're doing right now, we'll open it and one day just go, oh, my Lord, this is it. This is what he's talking about. All right. Um, how long shall I take counsel in my soul? That's a good question. Can I ask y'all that? How long y'all going to do that? How long do y'all intend on taking counsel in your soul? <laughs> Can I suggest that you, you lose that counselor? You know, and let's go with the Lord, okay? Um, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? Well, that's because you're listening to your freaking soul. You know, there's no surprise here. Stop acting like you're surprised, you know, at the end result of that. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Probably a long time with this kind of attitude. <laughs> right? Can you see it? Um... Consider and hear me. <laughs> That's like funny again. So now he's, he's calming down just a hair, not much. <laughs> Consider me and hear me. The Lord's going, all right, what do you got? Consider and hear me, O oh my, oh my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Now you're getting there. Lighten my eyes. I need to see Jesus, yes. lest this soul stuff, you know, overwhelm me like what we were reading up above. Overwhelm me. 
Verse 4, lest mine enemy say I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved, when you're motivated to move by your soul. See, that's, that's what, there are so many Psalms that, that really has that little theme right there, that the enemy is going to, and this is, this is David's deal, he's going, Lord, deliver my soul from this stuff. You know, save my soul out of this place that I'm at, lest mine enemy exalt over me because he he will mm -hmm. and and that that in that sense could even be your soul but you know let's say if it wasn't your enemy will exalt and exalt which is another word over your demise which the enemy was constantly trying to destroy david you know and what, what is the best way to destroy David? Not just to kill him, is to turn him. Yeah. It's to turn his soul where it becomes so putrefied that it's no longer with the Lord. Okay? Um, Thus my enemy say, I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation of his soul. See, he's got his heart still, you know, the core is still in place. Right? The heart's saying, uh, hey, I got, I got something here, you know. I got something here, Lord. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I have trusted in thy mercy. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. All right. So let's go to Psalm 33, verse 18. Can I, can I direct you to another place since time's getting short? Let's do Psalm 11, 1. We'll do 11, 1 through 7 because it's really, really good. Okay, this really shows... Uh, um, the struggle and yet the ability to be with the Lord. Psalm 11, verse 1. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrows upon the string that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. So here he's... He's, he's aware of what's going on. He's not ignorant. He realizes uh, somebody's saying to his soul, flee as a bird to, to your mountain. Go, go run away. Run away. You know, fly away. You know, escape. Okay? Verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In other words, we, we use that in some sort of spiritual, scriptural, churchy thing, you know. But he's talking about himself and us, all, any of us. If, you, if the enemy can destroy that foundation of Christ, what can you do? What can you do? <clears throat> um. Verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try, the children of men. Okay, so what does that mean? He's up there checking us out. <clears throat> What's he checking us out over? Verse 5, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. He's just measuring you know, Christ is his measuring rod. You know that, don't you? He measures everything by Christ. He can tell immediately. <laughs> he can tell immediately what's not Christ. Well, you know, what was I? Oh, God. I was looking in Luke again today about the, the um, Mary of Bethany and and they were in the house of the Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee, and, and, um, 
And Jesus, uh, Simon had invited him into his house. And Mary's washing Jesus' feet and kissing him and all this stuff. And Simon's going, uh, you know, if he knew what kind of woman this was, he would never let this happen. I mean, he's not a prophet. So Jesus, Jesus, you know, we think he only sees what we say and do. See? So we say a few things in church. You know, oh, I love the Lord or praise God or whatever, you know. But he hears all the junk that's going on in our head, too. And he turns to Simon and says, hey, Simon, let me ask you a question here, buddy. Uh, and, you know, he, he reads his mail back to him. <laughs> you know, he reads his mail back to him. And that's what this is talking about. He's not, see, we say two or three spiritual things in church. We have, you know, maybe a hundred judgments or a hundred bad thoughts or, or thoughts of other stuff or whatever. And that's all coming out. So here's the picture I got. I probably should have drawn this. God's up here looking down, so let's put him over a cloud. We're down here in church, da 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 da, and you put the word balloon where it says, Praise God. But put all these words coming out that's really in there. Like, well, if you really were, you know, this and that, and all of that stuff's going out, and, and God's just going like this. You know? And, um,. Uh, what was it? There was something else that I wrote down that, oh yeah. So this, this woman does this to Jesus. Simon, the, the Pharisee, which is also a leper, like he's got some room to judge. But anyway, uh, says this stuff, you know, well, if he really was a man of God, I mean, if he really was a prophet, he would know. So Jesus turns to him and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he says, yes, master. Yes, master. Come on. In his heart, he's tearing him down left and right. Oh, yes, master. You know, I mean, if I was Jesus, thank God I'm not Jesus. I'm just telling you right now. I would have said, shut up. I know what you were thinking. I don't know if I'd have done, I don't know if I'd have done that or not. But it's nice to think about it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but that, I just thought, golly, man, we're so dumb. We, we live in a Christian world instead of living in Christ. And we live in Christian explanations of everything. And that means that we can come to church and we can have any number of just wild, horrible things going on inside of us and still get away with it and leave and think we're okay. Y'all still glad you came? <laughs> when to him, it's just coming. He's just, he's getting it all. <clears throat> okay, there's a whole lot to this verse, and I, I'm starting to run over a little bit. Um, well, verse... Uh, Five, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. All right, well, the word righteous, I know that y'all, well, let me just say it. The word righteousness and upright are similar um, Greek words <clears throat> uh, based on the same thing. And that is righteousness. And righteousness, we always say, well, righteousness. I want, <clears throat> I want righteousness and I want holiness and I want all of this stuff. <clears throat> and it's good. I mean, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with the want. There's something wrong with where we're pointing at as the definition of that. Because... 
Brother Paul comes along and he, he defines it as, um, you know, Jesus has made unto you righteousness and sanctification and re redemption and all of those things so that he that glories, let him glory in the Lord, not in being righteous. Amen? And God comes along and says, your righteousness is as filthy rags. He didn't say your horrible sin is as filthy rags. He said the righteousness you're presenting is so not Christ. <laughs> you know, and that's the way he views it. And that's the way God views it. And Paul captured it and put it down in those scriptures and a bunch of other. Um, and David is in my opinion, doing the same thing. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness and his countenance doth be wholly upright. Folks, you, can't, you cannot go through Proverbs and, and point at every scripture there and say, that's me, I'm the upright one of that verse. No, I'm wrong. You can do that. But you're deceiving yourself. Jesus is the one that is, and we're the mess. And he's what it's all about. He's what it's all about in the Father's heart. Once you see the Father's heart, you, you'll understand clearly. You know, he could have just saved us, sent his son back up, and, but he put him in us. And he did it with purpose, 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 purpose. Anyway, all right, so we're going to quit, quit there. Um, this, believe it or not, this class has given you a big new jewel to work with because this is what we've discussed here, the salvation of our soul. This is a major factor of the thing that Peter's trying to communicate. Father, we ask you to continue to deal with us and move by your spirit and we want to know you and we want to know you by your word and we want to know you by your spirit. We want to be taken away with your thoughts and surrendering ours. We love you, Lord. We're here because we love you and want you. And we thank you that you are here because you want us to know your son. Thank you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.